Hi, I'm Carol Redwine, Grand Rapids Community College, and I am happy to have with me today B.D. Wong, better known as Dr. Wang. Wong. Wong, yes, yes. indeed. Dr. Wong from uh, Law, and Order, Law and Order SVU, one of my very special TV programs. Good to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carol. Okay, well, we're going to spend just a few minutes talking a little informally about uh, getting some information to know about you. I'd like to begin by asking you, though, about your school days. Okay, I'm a teacher, <laughs> so that's a good place to start. Okay. Um, I understand that you said you were mentored by a colorblind drama teacher. I was, yeah. Right. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that, to answer your question immediately, is that she 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 was an acting teacher, a drama teacher, and she she gave me parts, not thinking at all about the color of my skin or about the color of the skin of the part that she was giving me, right. or traditionally, you know, that the, the way those parts might have been cast in mm -hmm. the past, and that afforded me an opportunity, um, because there are not a lot of great parts written for Asian American guys okay. that, that afforded me an opportunity to grow and learn and explore and experiment in a craft which is really hard to learn mm -hmm. and um, gave me a lot of confidence uh, for, for later on in my life. I was just one of those kids that was really lucky to have found and to have been found by this woman. Um, she was she was a an English teacher who took on the drama department at our high school. Mm -hmm. She was very passionate about the theater. She wasn't particularly um, uh, well trained as a drama teacher or as, but she was. She loved the theater so much, mm -hmm. and she had real natural instincts. Instincts, and and her passion just uh, was contagious to me. And she saw something in me that w at a very crucial time in my life, and played a very instrumental part in in uh, helping me to kind of talk to my parents about what the ramifications of that were. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm I'm always very. Um, grateful and um, and remember her very fondly. It was it was a really um, lucky thing for me to have experienced my relationship with her. Well that's good and, I, and you said something that that makes me think about something else that uh, people often say and that is that for a lot of Asian students that parents, your parents, uh. want you to go into med school, law school, they want you to go into those hard academic subjects. How did your parents deal with the idea of your wanting to go into the arts? They were, tr they were at the very outset very traditional about it. Mm -hmm. I have an older brother, he's nine years older than me. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I was talking about these things, uh, I was, my, he was in probably in med school or pre-med or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he had established himself as a as as going the the right way, you know. <laughs> and that made it both easier and more difficult for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had had a success and so that was good. But they were tr very they were traditionally minded. They're third generation um, Chinese Americans who grew up and were born and raised in in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But I think like a lot of parents or or children or grandchildren of immigrants, there's a there's a a sense that you know, well, we must kind of instill in the following generation something better than what we had, and and that's kind of the whole point of immigrating in the first place, uh -huh. in some ways. And so they had with them the instinct mm -hmm. to um, uh, afford, you know, to offer me the education and the opportunity and the insight to allow me to have a better career than they had. Mm -hmm. My mother worked for the phone company for uh, more than twenty five years. She was had a, she had a very solid and wonderful career, and my dad worked at, as, at the post office, you know, both very solid, kind of, you know, really hardworking people. Uh, but I think they had an opportunity for my career to be informed by my education, oh. and they wanted that, and, and I think that's a very natural inclination. What they didn't see coming, and what I didn't see coming, was that I just had an affinity, a passion, um, um, and, and, a, and a talent for a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that threw us all a curve for a second there. Um, I think this teacher was really instrumental in saying, look, this is the thing you have to go with right now. This is the thing that's, that, that not, a lot of, not a lot of kids have this. So go with this and see what happens to it. And, and, and I think my parents, while my dad was, while my dad was living and, and my mother certainly, um, were very proud of the fact that they were able to make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the role that they played in my success 
uh, is, 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 of course, goes right down to that time, goes right back to that time. So I'm grateful to them as well. Well, you know, as a teacher, I'm always concerned that, in the public schools anyway, that many times those courses that are the arts courses, yes. your music, your drama, your other arts, if there are going to be cuts, then unfortunately sometimes they go to those classes yeah. because they are not part of the, uh, the academic pursuits. That's right. Now, how do you think we can kind of reinforce the fact that there are some kids like yourself who need that and that it's okay and that they, we need to keep those courses viable? Yeah, this is a really uh, um, age-old kind of traditional thinking driven a problem that I see everywhere and mm -hmm. that is is I'm not really sure how to take on um, you know I'm not really an expert in these things all I can say is that my opinion is that not enough people realize that um, storytelling entertainment music drama dance all of those things that we think are elective and, and extracurricular are part and parcel of our daily life. I mean, if since we were cavemen sitting around the campfire telling right. stories to each other, mm -hmm. we need that aspect of, we, you know, we turn the television on because we need it. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't do without it. If you ask anybody to do without it, they would be really hard pressed to do without it. And, and it's interesting that people don't think of it that way. They don't think of their music and their iPods and their, their, the entertainment on their television and the movies that they actually pay to go see. Right. You know, when times are tough, maybe you'll see less movies or something like that. Or maybe you'll cut down on channels on your cable bill or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you can't get rid of all of it. Mm -hmm. There's just no, I, I'd be very surprised if you introduced me to somebody who said that they could get rid of all of it. Therefore something needs to feed those industries. Right. And the people need to be educated just like they are in other vocations to learn how to do these things properly. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little frustrating to me um, as, a, as an actor, as a parent, as a lot of different things to, to see these cuts and these, these, these uh, compromises being made in these areas because um, I don't think it's been, I don't think it's landed. I don't think it's been brought home that it's really a, a part and parcel of, of be living, being a living, breathing human being. Mm -hmm. It's always thought of as that extra thing. Right. It's always thought of as as extracurricular or or um, uh, uh, frivolous in some ways. Exactly. That that's not going to get you the kind of job that's going to be yes. considered to be successful it's, or lucrative. Well, you know, it's a viable career mm -hmm. in in some ways, depending upon what your talent and what your your interest is, the entertainment business, and I'm not really recruiting here, but, uh, <laughs> but it really is true that the entertainment business is as viable a, a career as, as, as any. Mm -hmm. um, being an actor is a very specific proposition. It's very difficult to be an actor. You really have to have the chops for not only the work itself, but the entire emotional mechanism that needs to be in place in order for you to be able to deal with it. The rejection that you re spoke the of rejection, a few yeah. minutes ago. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's part of it. You right. can't be naive in thinking that you're going to be exempt from it in any way. Mm -hmm. The greatest actors in the world have lots of stories to tell about how they weren't chosen for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And it's a very subjective process. And you learn to uh, have a bit of a tough skin about it. And, yes. and so uh, that's something you have to be able to um, accept if mm -hmm. you want to really go for it. However, the entertainment business in general is an, is an industry that's full of incredible opportunities. But now, I read somewhere where you said that it was not particularly welcoming to you. I think the word was, it was non-welcoming to you as an Asian American. Can you, it, do you yeah. still believe that? Is that still true? I think you, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you are in tune to it as much as I and other Asian Americans might be to it, and you turn on the TV looking for Asian Americans, mm -hmm. and you realize how few you see, mm -hmm. you'll realize that it, 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 to an Asian American, it's, it's kind of unwel unwelcoming. And that, that's the, the eff effect that it has on a young kid who's, you know, we as young kids, we're looking into the media, into the popular culture for a reflection of ourselves, particularly in America, which is supposed to be or, or I like to think of it as, as, as built on a foundation of diversity. Mm -hmm. It's completely what makes us great in some ways. And um, it is what's so interesting that... Um, Thank you. That, uh, sure. That I, what, what's so interesting to me is that we, we don't really um, realize that, that the, the, the role that the media and the and popular culture can play in a, in a young person's life. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, 
anything from, say, anorexia to, to the way that people treat other people can be affected by what we see on television and, and, and in the popular culture. So, so as, a, as an Asian American looking to, to uh, a television show or, or, or watching television and, and not seeing myself kind of did a number on me. Uh -huh. And I think that was a reason why I would describe it as unwelcoming at the, at the juncture in my life in which I decided to become an actor. I thought, well, why would you want to do that if that's all there is pointing to the television? Right. And um, my passion was pretty strong, you know, and I and I and I was a little idealistic, and I was really um, uh, had a lot of confidence, and I also thought that uh, inevitably, if the right things were to happen, things could possibly change, and so I went into it. Um, but it was it was like walking into a place where you. You, you're not really quite sure whether or not there's going to be a, a you know, a, um, a job for you or a, or, a, or a place at the table, mm -hmm. as it, as it, as it were. When you were Stuart uh, on The All-American Girl yeah. with Margaret Cho, uh -huh. and I, I like her too, she's really funny, yeah. <laughs> but you said that that show misfired. Um, there hasn't been an Asian American family portrayed since. Do you think that that will happen? Or why do you think that show misfired? The show misfired primarily because Margaret is an extremely unique talent, mm -hmm. and that uniqueness about her wasn't really um, part of what drove the creation of the show. And when a, 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 a star like that is on a television show and, and, and all of the wonderful, unique things about that person are not recognized or, or um, utilized, the show has a falseness to it. And mm -hmm. the show had a falseness to it because Margaret was simply not the person that she was portraying in the show. Mm -hmm. And she herself would tell you this. Uh -huh. um, it, 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 she's a really um, rambunctious, kind of out of the box thinking, um, renegade, rebel. Um, you know, she's not kind of a sweet television personality. Mm -hmm. And what would have been great was a much edgier show. Mm -hmm. And she has a much, much, much edgier show now on television, which which is not necessarily what I'm talking about from a, from a network standpoint, but something much more suited to her sass and, and, and kind of political sensibility and her uh, desire to change um, would have been much more suited to her and much more um, courageous and interesting and groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. The fact that there hasn't been an Asian, well, first of all, we were the first Asian American television family, and that was 1995. I mean, that's a long time in the history of television to not have an entire re uh, ethnic group represented on television. And, and sh um, you know, I don't think that the demise of the show helped that equation at all. I, I definitely see it happening. I think that Asian American people, um, I think, you know, every culture has a lot of unique, interesting, and yet somehow ironically universal aspects to it. Exactly. And so inevitably the 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 the, the tide turns and, and that that universality can be found in your community and so hopefully the tide would turn in our favor in that way eventually soon. Well looking now at your um, work as a stage actor in M Butterfly yes. and you also have something coming up, Herringbone, is it? Yes. Oh. I have been working on and off in this play or a musical called Herringbone for mm -hmm for many years now and have done, luckily enough to be having done several productions of it around the country in different places. And I recently, recently just finished one mm -hmm. in Princeton, New Jersey, off the campus of Princeton University at, at a wonderful theater called the McCarter Theater, um, a really fine regional theater, um, American regional theater. And uh, so that was an interesting, um, uh, venture for me because it was driven by me. And one of the things that I've learned in my um, challenges as an actor over the year, as an Asian American or not, is that self-generation is really important for an artist of color and for, for me in particular to, to drive a project or to pitch a project to someone rather than just being an actor and waiting for someone to hire you mm -hmm. is really empowering and really um, a, a, a very good key to success. So that was a, a project that I kind of said to people, hey, look, I want to do this. Will you produce this show so that I can do it? And that's, 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 what that, that's kind of the unique um, 
my relationship, my unique relationship to that material. It's a one-man show? It is, yes. Okay, now, how, if you wanted to compare mm -hmm. in Butterfly yes. and Herringbone, how would you compare those in terms of both those roles? Because they seem to be demanding, I'm sure, in different ways, yes. but how would you compare those uh, as an actor? There are two roles for me, and on my list of all the roles that I've ever played, they're probably the two most demanding parts. Mm -hmm. um, M. Butterfly, which I did when I was very young, was a, a, a kind of gender-bending kind right. of part, and it, and it was the, the whole crux of the conceit of the play, which was that a man had a relationship with um, a, an opera star and didn't realize that she, in fact, was a man. Mm -hmm. The whole crux of that play rests on the performance itself, if, uh, arguably. And so I felt a lot of pressure doing that pr play, rehearsing that play, wondering whether I could, you know, pull it off and, and all of that. And, and um, so that's one, a very specific kind of play and a very specific kind of performance. And it is a play with 12 actors in it in which um, the, the drama is between two main actors. And I was one of those two main actors. And so um, it was a very unique uh, working experience for me. Herringbone is a one-person show, and it also has a little 11 or 12 characters in it, and yet I'm playing all of them, and they're all talking to each other, and it's all very kind of schizophrenic and very intense and extremely exhausting physically. And so it's very different totally in its uh, in its in identity as M. Butterfly. Mm -hmm. it, it shares with it that there are there's, there are different genders and there are different, uh, you know, I play women as well as men in the play and there's, a, there's um, an interesting drama that occurs in the, in the play and conflict and, and resolution. It's also a musical, so it's kind of vocally demanding and requires a lot of vocal stamina and um, preparation. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I, I think I'd say, I think because of the self-generation that I mentioned earlier, to you that it's even more rewarding to me because I kind of brought this play to the attention of everyone who produces it and and therefore I'm very satisfied by the work even more because um, I know that it, I, you know it was an opportunity I gave to myself it's almost like a gift mm -hmm. um, but every every play and every part are different and, and every ex personal experience that you have in a in a play and in, and in any that the interesting thing about acting is that you go from job to job. You don't right. have one job for your whole career. Mm -hmm. You have tons of different jobs, and you move from different jobs like a gypsy, from job to job, meeting a whole family of people every time, mm -hmm. and then sometimes maintaining relationships with people in that family, and sometimes you don't see them again ever. Right. And, and that's interesting and different, and, and you, you become accustomed to that. And, and so every job has its own kind of unique... Um, uh, fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Do you find that filmmakers and television directors think that because you are Asian you can play any person of any Asian descent? Because sometimes people get into the, if they think Asian they think either Chinese or Japanese and we know that's not true. Yes. But do you think that filmmakers and TV directors get into that sometimes? I think they do and I think it's a very nuanced and uh, complex discussion, you mm -hmm. know. In theory, I became an actor to play all people of all different nationalities, mm -hmm. the way that Meryl Streep plays a Polish person and an Italian person and, 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 and affects different dialects, and that's part of her brilliance. Mm -hmm. And so I always advocate that I should ap actually have those opportunities as well. And at and, and, and other times, I think it's probably best if a person of that, that nationality plays the part. It just depends on the part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get something from a person's performance because they really know that culture well, and sometimes it doesn't matter that much, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not really so Chinese Chinese that I can only play a Chinese person because I don't know the Chinese experience, the Chinese national experience, any more than I know the Japanese national experience or the mm -hmm. Thai national experience. I'm, an, you know, I'm a, a fourth-generation American, and so my real... Ironically enough, my real um, values and, and uh, understanding of the culture and, and the way that I speak and everything are pretty American. And so um, it is a pretty interesting discussion to have with various directors of various, in various projects because it's, it's, it, 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 it's a real case-by-case -case discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sometimes when we're talking about diversity, 
people want to know, well, how do I, in a sensitive way, ask someone what their ethnic background is, what their nationality is? And, you know, you want to say, well, are you Chinese or Japanese? Yes. How, do you, how do you do that with finesse? That question often comes up. Well, gosh, I'm not sure if I know. <laughs> I guess I can answer that um, from my own point of view, which is mm -hmm. that if someone asks me, um, uh, I guess sometimes people ask me what country my grandparents came from. Okay. Now, my, 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 my grandparents came from Hong Kong, so that would be an answer that would lead to another discussion about you know, my people and all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, that's, I guess, as graceful a way to ask as any. I'm not sure what, you know, it also depends on how well you know somebody, you know, how familiar you are with them and how much trust and, and, and familiarity you have with them. Um, another way, I, well, I don't, I'm not sure what else there, what other way there is except for that. Um, I don't think there's a way that you can really trick somebody into telling you without asking them, <laughs> and so, which would be kind of convenient, but mm -hmm. I think it's probably best to kind of gently and, and, and politely ask an, an intelligent question right. you know, about their background. Oh, tell, mm -hmm. me about, tell me about your ethnic background, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, you know I, I, and, and, and maybe humble yourself by saying, I don't know much about these things, so mm -hmm. forgive me for asking or something like that. But you know, I ask you that because the young lady in the, uh, in the discussion with the students a few minutes ago, she asked you about how can we get past some people's resistance yes. to, and you talked about tolerance. Yes. And you said that the, you didn't, and I like what you said about not liking the word tolerance because the word tolerate is in there. And I made a note to myself thinking, yes, that means to put up with. Yes, and to put up with. Yeah. And that does that's seem to be something that's not quite what we want to go for. No, it's not, it doesn't quite e e connote equality. No. It, you know, it's like, oh, I'll put up with <laughs> you, but I, I, it doesn't mean I have to consider you my equal. Exactly. And that's pretty heavy, actually, to right. me. <laughs> and with that word being used so much, when you said that, it really struck a note with me, and I thought, aha, got to make a mental note of you that. You know, Carol, I think that it comes from a, a history of civil rights, mm -hmm. and, and, and if you can look back on the er, origin of civil rights, I mean, tolerance is all we could accept, expect at that time, mm -hmm. at, or even ask for. You That's know, true. Th people were violently treated with, with, with no respect, and, and so all you could ask is, is, okay, please just tolerate me and leave me alone. Well, we, well, I think I'd like to say that maybe we've come along a, a little bit from there mm -hmm. and that, that maybe that word is obsolete yes. and that what we're really looking for is equality and that if we tried to use the word equality back in the 60s, we would have been met with probably further resistance. So, so maybe that's just a sign of our progress. Right. You know? Well, I certainly hope so because I yes. really think that that is something for us to consider. <laughs> well, let's talk about something that I know you want to talk about. Really? Makes you happy. Oh, How's yeah. Jackson doing? <laughs> that's very nice. He's doing tremendously well. I'm, I'm enjoying this particular phase of my relationship with him, really, even in the last few months, actually. Mm -hmm. He's um, eight years old now, yes. and um, he's a very um, um, energetic and, and um, mischievous, and, and, but mischievous in a kind of humorous way. Like, mm -hmm. he, loves, he loves words and, and, and um, uh, a kind of make-believe and, and creating different situations in, in which it can make somebody smile or laugh. And I, I do like that. I, I've always enjoyed for myself mm -hmm. making people laugh. And, and so I see that in him a little bit, and I do enjoy that he does like to make people laugh. Is he going to be an actor as well? Sounds like he might be heading in that direction. You know, he's, he definitely is very hammy. Mm -hmm. And I do love seeing him when he gets in his most hammiest moods. However, he does not seem at this point in time to like the spotlight cast on him. Okay. He, he's one of those children that uh, goes into an elaborate fantasy, really loud and full of words about something in alone in his room, and you hear him doing it, and then mm -hmm. as soon as you look around the corner, he's not he's, there anymore. He's not there anymore. No. Okay. He, and, and, you say, and you say, oh, hey, um, show grandma how you do that thing. 
No, no he's no, a little shy no, yet. Yeah. Okay. And no, actually, beyond shy, actually, kind of like absolutely not. You know, that's not. I'm, I'm not a trained seal. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, that's there's something to be said for that I attitude think so. as well. <laughs> yeah, and I have said those words myself. So I, you know, it's a bit of a karmic thing for me because, um, you know, of course, and I think to myself, yes, you're absolutely right. I have no right to just try to make you perform like that for Grandma. Although it's just because it's so darn cute I know that it. I want to do Daddy it. Daddy loves know? it. Yeah. Well, one last question. We have time for one last question, and okay, that sure, is right. the book, Following Fu. Yes. I love that title. Can't be an English teacher and not love a powerful title. <laughs> but also, you had kind of a little subtitle there that says, A True Story of Intensive Caring. Yes. Why did you write that? What do you want us to get from that book? I wrote the book because something really rather traumatic happened to me when um, uh, uh, when I decided to become a parent. Mm -hmm. And the thing that basically happened was that um, I was blessed with the, with the hope and joy of learning that the surrogate that was, was, was giving us the gift of, of carrying um, a child for us was discovered to have identical twins. Mm -hmm. The identical twins were born 13 months prematurely and only one of them survived. And he is the son that I speak of to right. such pride. So it was a very mixed, uh, experience entering parenthood for me. It was the joy and an exhilaration of becoming a parent mm -hmm. mixed with actual grief. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't think there's anything else in life quite like this equation of joy and uh, happiness and despair. And so, however, I'm the, I process things a certain way and I, I realized throughout this trauma that, I, that I've written about in this book that it happened to me for a reason. And I think one of the reasons that it happened to me is so that I could share it in some mm -hmm. way. And I shared it because I have a certain knack for writing things down a certain way, mm -hmm. and a certain sense of humor and a perspective that's not, um, I don't know, it's not better than anybody else's, but it's, I guess it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. Even though it's, it's what happened was really hard. Right. It's, it's somehow an entertainer's spirit to, to, to relay it to other people in a way that can possibly I don't know, make them think or value life a certain way or something like that. And so that's what I want them to get out of it. I really thought the experience happened to me and, and if, if anybody else has any remotely similar an experience, they can deal with their grief in a way that has the perspective and the humor that I tried to bring to my story. Well, we certainly thank you for coming to Grand Rapids and to oh, Grand yes. Rapids Community College. Thank you. I am going to be looking at Law & Order SVU with a new perspective now oh, because gosh. I have met B.B. Wong. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Carol. Appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thanks, Bye now.